Which brings us to chapter 29, and for those of you who, who recognize the uh, heading here, it says compare 2 Nephi 27. This is the chapter, the Isaiah chapter in the Book of Mormon that has more edits, more adaptations than any of the uh, included Isaiah chapters in the Book of Mormon. And that brings up the question, is it Nephi who's, who's redacting, or do the brass plates show up exactly the way they appear in our Book of Mormon, and later on what the, the Masoretic texts and the, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the other ancient uh, parts of the Old Testament that we have in the Hebrew, did they get modified after Nephi had left? Great questions. So, just a quick thought about this, uh, whether 2 Nephi 27 restores Isaiah's original language, or whether it's a Nephite prophetic likening or adaptation that Nephi has authority to do. Now, I actually have an opinion, and that is that this is an example of Nephi adding, focusing us in closely on his sacred text, which is the Book of Mormon, right, the one that he's creating. But, but others, I don't want to distract because others might disagree with that, and we don't know the answer at the end of the day. What I do think can be helpful is to broaden our understanding of this beyond the Book of Mormon and view sealed, words of sealed texts, not just as a Book of Mormon has a sealed portion and it goes in the ground and then it comes forth in the last days, which is true and powerful, but to see how that happens with biblical teachings as well, and biblical prophets also become voices that speak from the dust of the earth, right? That's powerful. Uh, Isaiah certainly does. And, and the Book of Mormon talks about it this way, Second Nephi 3, I'm going to pull together the, the teachings of what we understand as the Bible, right, the teachings of Judah and the teachings of Ephraim, and they are going to restore. And, and Joseph Smith as the farmer prophet, right, the, the ignorant one, so to speak, who then doesn't just unseal an ancient Book of Mormon text, but unseals the Bible for a Latter-day Saint audience, and they unseal each other, right? That's they, right. They, they work together. That's right. If you, if you understand <laughs> the Bible, you will better understand the Book of Mormon, and if you understand the Book of Mormon, you can use that to unlock greater, deeper insights and meaning in the Bible, and it's an iterative process. It just keeps feeding and growing over time as you, as you keep immersing in both. So look at verse 4. <clears throat> Sean's already alluded to this. Thou shalt be brought down, and shalt speak out of the ground, and thy speech shall be low out of the dust and thy voice shall be as one that hath a familiar spirit." So there are ways to see how the Book of Mormon, the, these plates being buried in Hill Cumorah, could literally fulfill this, but Isaiah, his, his seership writing is so big and so broad that it can be applied in myriad ways. For us as Latter-day Saints, we love this Book of Mormon application to that prophecy, that those scriptures were laid low, and now they're speaking out of the ground, out of the dust. And when we hear the, the words of the book, they have a familiar spirit. There's a, there's a connection there to what we already know from the Bible. It's beautiful imagery. It's really powerful imagery. And there are images of sealed books, Book of Revelation, you know, the, this, this scroll that has seven seals on it. Sometime you should spend, we, we, you should go and spend some time in Jeremiah 32, where he's, he's talking about buying a plot of land, and you're gonna make two copies of the purchase contract, and one you're gonna bury in the ground, and one you're gonna keep above the ground. Well, why do you bury the one in the ground? because there's a fear that the one above the ground is going to be tampered with, and so if you, if you get that suspicion, you unbury the one and you compare, but you need one above ground so you can read it, right? That has the power that, that allows you to track the message, right? But then if you get to the point where you're like, ooh, are we sure this is the original message? You unbury the other one, you compare them, and they work to corroborate each other, right? It was sort of a fascinating moment with a sealed buried record in Jeremiah 32, but also this important above-ground record, so to speak. So with verse 11, I love this introduction here, the vision of all is become unto you. By the way, the vision of all, the, these, we sometimes refer to them as panoptic vision uh, 
a, a view of everything. The vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, read this, I pray thee, and he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And if you read this part of the story in 2 Nephi 27, you're going to see some significant expansion of detail here in, in the conversation between he who is learned, he who is not learned, and the words of the book versus the book, the book symbolic in this context of the plates and the words being a translation, and you watch chapter 27 unfold in your Book of Mormon, it's uncanny how, how beautifully it lines up with that story of Martin Harris taking a, a translated portion, so you have some characters along with the translation, he takes those words to uh, Samuel Latham Mitchell and Charles Anthon, and then the famous story of Charles Anthon saying, well then bring me the book, I'll read it, and Martin saying, I can't, part of it's sealed, I can't read a sealed book, and later on them, them making this connection back to, to uh, Isaiah chapter 29. It's pretty fun. It, it really is. And then, as, as we've been doing, if you think of that famous line that is attributed to Tyndale, I will, and I'm going to misquote him a little bit, I will make it so the plowboy can understand the Bible better than you. The Bible has become, in Tyndale's view, has become a sealed book, and I want the uneducated to have access to it, and they're going to understand it better than you do. And then that resonates so deeply in the Latter-day Saint soul, of course, because of our, our boy prophet, Joseph Smith, who then the Book of Mormon unlocks the Bible, and, and he's he becomes that plow boy, you might say. Which now brings us to look at verse 13, wherefore the Lord said, so this would be Jehovah saying, for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. It's fascinating because when this plowboy, this 14-year-old farm boy, goes into a grove of trees near his home, he goes in asking which church he should join, and when he is visited by the father and the son, and the Father's message to him is, Joseph, this is my beloved Son, hear him, and it seems that Jesus is doing, it seems, most of the interacting, most of the talking. Well, in the 1838 account of the first vision, listen to the very first thing after the introduction and telling Joseph the, the answer to his question of which church to join, look at what Jesus Christ Jehovah of the Old Testament, the Lord hath said, well, he's going to say it again. He's, it's as if he's quoting Isaiah, but no, Isaiah was quoting the Lord, so Jesus is now just saying the same thing to Joseph. Look at uh, Joseph Smith history, verse 19. Halfway down it says, they draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They, te they teach for doctrines the commandments of men, having a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. It's this exact concept from Isaiah 29 that he's just repeating to this young prophet. One of the first things Joseph hears opening up the dispensation is a quote from Isaiah. You remember the introduction where we were given this overview and said, these are the woe chapters where you see the futility of worldly approaches and worldly kingdoms compared with the wisdom of God. So verse 13 flows into verse 14. He's setting up this beautiful pronouncement in verse 14. Therefore, behold, I, will I, the Lord, will proceed to do a marvelous work among the people, a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. You can jump right into verse 18. In that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book. Remember these sealed words that are no longer accessible or understood. And the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. And then listen to the way this connects with 2 Nephi 3 and, and, it, and when it's talking about the writings of Judah and the writings of Ephraim. The result of this book being unsealed, the blind seeing, the deaf hearing the words of the book, they also that erred in spirit shall come to understanding, they that murmured shall learn doctrine. And this is the conclusion. And of course, the, the Latter-day Saint heart is going to thrill to see uh, this playing out 
in in the teachings of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Which, by the way, it, it shouldn't come as a surprise or as a shock to anybody that when God begins to do his work, there, there's always an opposition from the adversary and, and from the world, and you even see that here in this chapter, this, this little allusion along the way to, to verse 21, that make a man an offender for a word, and lay a snare for him that reproveth in the gate, and turn aside the just for a thing of naught. You, you can apply that verse in a variety of ways to prophets and scripture through the ages, but in the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, I think it's fascinating with that whole sequence of the lost 116 pages, that what did they do? They changed them. Why? So that they could make Joseph an offender for a word here and a word there to say, oh, see, he's not a prophet, because they're setting aside the book as a thing of naught. It's of no value, so we're going to use it as an instrument to destroy you now as you retranslate 